Today we're going to talk about school reopening this fall. More specifically, the public health considerations for these plans. I appreciate Dr. Razga being here today to talk about his research on this virus in schools, camps, child care centers, and other group settings for kids. He's a pediatric infectious disease specialist, and his editorial in Pediatrics Magazine was brought up in our press conference earlier this week. We're also joined by Dr. Levine, as always, and Dr. Kelso, our state epidemiologist, to talk about their role in, um, in developing guidance for schools this fall and how it's informed by science and data. Before I turn it over to the health experts, I want to talk a little bit about what opening means in this context, because I know there are many teachers, administrators, and other school staff, as well as many parents and kids who have concerns about what this might look like and the potential risks. To start, I want to be clear. Just like I have done throughout this pandemic, I'm watching the data and listening to the experts. With that in mind, we're keeping a close eye on what's going on around the country. And to be honest, I'm concerned. While our trends still look really good here in Vermont, we're seeing a forest fire take hold across the south and west. And I'm worried it will backtrack to the northeast and eventually affect us in Vermont. So I want to reassure you, we're watching it. And we're contemplating steps we may need to establish a line of defense if that proves to be the case. At the same time, given our current positive trends, we also need to aim for and plan for school openings. Because if our data shows we can do it safely, it's the very best option for our kids. Next, we should recognize open has a different meaning since mid-March, whether it's retail stores, coffee shops, offices, healthcare practices, salons. Open doesn't mean the way it was back in January. Today's open comes with many conditions. These openings all include precautions and restrictions our public health experts have advised we include to help people keep safe and healthy. We're using the same approach as we work toward opening schools. There are going to be many public health measures we must implement to reopen safely. And just like in other areas, it will require some problem solving by teachers and local leaders because it's not going to be a simple return to the status quo. Classrooms not, might not be full for the foreseeable future, nor will school cafeterias or gymnasiums. And we expect to use a hybrid model in which remote learning and remote curriculums will be a major factor. But we also need the flexibility to include in-person instruction which we know is valuable to our kids and is something we couldn't offer in March, April, and May when we began fighting this virus. Everyone stepped up this spring to quickly move classes online or to remote formats, and their efforts have not gone unnoticed. They did a great job under incredibly difficult circumstances. But we've said all along, there's no substitute for the learning that play, takes place in our schools. And parents, and especially our kids, deserve the best education we can possibly provide. The unfortunate reality is we're going to be managing this health crisis for many more months to come, working constantly to limit the spread so Vermonters stay safe, while making sure we can do the things we must do to keep our society going. We know we cannot completely shut down while we wait for a vaccine. We've had success with a cautious reopening thus far. And if we're going to do the best we possibly can for kids, it's vitally important, based on recommendations from health experts and where we are with the virus today, to reopen our schools. Kids need the structure, the relationships with their peers, their teachers and other adults for their academic, social, and emotional development. As well as everyone did to quickly move to remote learning, we know a fully remote format 
creates gaps that kids can fall through. And unfortunately, this has a greater impact on some students than others. We know equity gaps already exist based on differences in kids' needs, their home environments, and, and countless other variables. And these are exacerbated when educating only through remote learning. So we must do all we can to make sure that doesn't happen. I have complete confidence in our education system, its teachers, principals, superintendents, school board members, parents, and kids to meet this challenge head on. It won't be easy, but a lot of work has already been done. We have six more weeks to get ready, and we have a lot of common ground that we can build on to help kids succeed as we deal with the adversity of this pandemic. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Levine to talk more about the health factors in school reopenings. Dr. Levine. <clears throat> Thank you, Governor. Certainly the topic of reopening schools continues to be in the news and has become somewhat politically charged at the national level. Many of you may be hearing what seem to be conflicting messages. In Vermont, the Department of Health and the Agency of Education have recently published guidance on pre-K to 12 opening. There is no question that educating students, making sure they are making progress, and safeguarding their health, welfare, and nutrition has been made vastly more difficult by the presence of the coronavirus. But we also know much more about the virus than we did back in March. Have a good understanding of the prevalence of the virus today in our state, are able to track and monitor data real time effectively, and have many strengths in the testing and contact tracing arena to build upon and that help mitigate the risk of reopening. In the process, we reviewed multiple sources of guidance, including Centers for Disease Control and the American Academy of Pediatrics, which continue to be revisited and revised as appropriate. Vermont's safety and health guidance is clearly and emphatically focused on the safety of students, teachers, and staff. The process we went through was comprehensive, thoughtful, and engaged a multidisciplinary task force to develop specific Vermont guidance. There was abundant input and feedback from Vermonters who are pediatricians, including the director of our maternal child health division at the health department, Dr. Holmes, pediatric infectious disease experts, one of whom you'll meet in a moment, public health experts, psychologists, special educators, school nurses, and of course, education professionals. We also examined the negative impact of not reopening schools on the intellectual, social, and emotional development of our children. Our document represents our best judgment based on current information, and it will be updated regularly as new information and science becomes available. At this time, our Vermont data continues to support the safe opening of schools, and we are ready to reassess at any point. Now, to put all of what I have said in context, I'm pleased to introduce two other speakers. First, Dr. William Raska, a UVM pediatric infectious disease specialist, will discuss a recent editorial, editorial he wrote in the journal Pediatrics and the science and pediatric studies to date regarding transmission patterns of viral infection, some of which I've discussed here previously. He will also speak to the tremendous support Vermont's pediatric community is providing to this reopening process. Next, a familiar face, our state epidemiologist, Dr. Patsy Kelso, will address the epidemiological basis for reopening schools, our capacity to test and trace, and our use of data and decision making. Dr. Rask.
Thank you very much for inviting me. So in May, Dr. Ben Lee and I wrote a commentary in the journal Pediatrics in which we stated that serious consideration should be paid towards strategies that allow st schools to remain open even during periods of COVID transmission and spread. We based that on three distinct findings, the first of which that children are less likely to become infected, the second is that children are less likely to develop severe disease, and thirdly, and critically, children seem less likely to transmit the virus that causes COVID-19. The data to support our recommendations are as follows. In multiple household context studies conducted in both Switzerland and China and other countries, overwhelmingly transmission of COVID within families was from adults to children. Very infrequently were there cases of children transmitting the disease to adults. That would occur in much less than 10% of the time. In Iceland, Early in the pandemic, when they tested a large percentage of their population, very few children were infected, and they could only document that they suspected two children had transmitted potentially the virus to adults. In Norway, the Ministry of Health has found remarkably little data to support that children are transmitting the virus to adults. Several school-based studies, particularly in young children, have not shown significant transmission of COVID within schools. In France, one COVID-infected nine-year-old boy exposed more than 80 students. There were no cases of secondary infection. Also in France, three children under the age of 10 exposed multiple classmates in three schools. There were no secondary cases. In Ireland, Three children and three adults had 924 child contacts and 101 adult contacts. There were no secondary cases. In Australia, nine students and nine staff infected across 15 schools <clears throat> had, had close contact with a total of 735 students and 128 staff. Only two secondary infections were identified, none in the adult staff. One student in primary school was potentially infected by a staff member, while one student in high school was potentially infected via exposure to two classmates. I should temper that a little bit by stating that in France, in one high school, antibody studies did suggest that high school students in that area had been infected frequently. Since publication of our commentary, more data has emerged. In Europe, many schools opened this spring using a variety of mitigation strategies once the prevalence of COVID within the area was controlled. The data in these countries with low COVID prevalence rates is reassuring. In Denmark, they did not see an uptick in cases or in school outbreaks. In Norway, they did not see an uptick in cases or school outbreaks. Germany did not see an uptick in cases or significant school outbreaks. A study of 2,000 children in school using antibody testing suggested a very low rate of infection in those children who had attended school. In school systems where no mitigation strategies were implemented, however, there is data to suggest <clears throat> increased positivity rate in children, but teachers in schools have the same infectivity rate as adults in the community. In areas where school mitigation policies were not or could not be followed, <clears throat> or widespread community transmission was taking place, namely Israel, multiple outbreaks have been reported. The data all support reopening schools with appropriate mitigation strategies. In June, an interdisciplinary team with stakeholders agreement and buy-in from Department of Health, school nurses, principals, teachers, met to discuss mitigation strategies to help minimize any potential spread of COVID in schools. A key recommendation was to require universal cloth face coverings even in young children not easily expected to transmit the disease. The data supporting facial cloth covering to prevent transmission is compelling. And for a few examples, on a United States warship, <clears throat> use of masking reduced infection rates from eight by 30%. In Massachusetts hospitals, universal masking of patients reduced infection rates in healthcare workers. And most recently, in Missouri, COVID positive hairstylists did not transmit infection to more than 130 contacts because they were wearing facial cloth coverings. 
We believe that universal face cloth coverings will be an important part of any school mitigation policy. We have discussed school opening on multiple occasions on our VCHIP calls, that's the Vermont Community Health Improvement Projects, and overwhelmingly pediatricians support reopening schools with appropriate mitigation strategies. Schools may be different next year and will be different, but we believe strongly that with appropriate policies in place that it will be a, a rich and robust environment for education and a safe one as well. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Pelsa. <clears throat> Thanks, Dr. Raska. Vermont stands with the science. We have stood with the science throughout this whole pandemic response, and we continue to do so. And as Dr. Raska mentioned, um, we um, have had, we've looked at the data, we've looked at other states and countries where they've restarted school, and we have, in fact, been, uh, had a lot of experience over the last several months with childcare settings being open. And we strongly feel at the health department that the data currently supports opening of school. We are seeing more cases of children um, with COVID-19 nationwide and in Vermont, but that's not surprising as we move about more in society and interact more and as more sectors of the economy have opened. We have testing available more broadly in Vermont than we did before. It's more accessible to children through their medical homes, and it's more acceptable to young people because we have nasal swab testing available rather than the NP swab, which is more invasive. And we know that in Vermont, children ages zero through nine years make up only about 3% of all of our Vermont cases and children between the ages of 10 and 19 make up about 7% of cases. So they are a minority of the cases that we are seeing in Vermont, despite the fact that we have broad testing available. And the governor talked about the concerning trends we're seeing with increasing COVID-19 transmission in other states. We're watching that very closely, but right now Vermont is in a different place than those other states. We have through our community mitigation efforts over the last months, um, achieved a, a level of disease suppression in our communities that we think makes it appropriate to take this next step with opening schools. You've heard that the Strong and Healthy Start guidance for school reopening was developed with broad support and um, feedback and input from infectious disease and pediatric health experts public health experts and education experts. And we had daily meetings to discuss all aspects of school reopening. And there are certainly challenges, and we feel like we've addressed those well in the guidance document. There are three main strategies. Um, we want to keep COVID-19 out of schools, and so that's where things like uh, daily screenings for symptoms come into play for students, teachers, and staff to keep COVID out. But we recognize that there may in fact be cases of COVID-19 in schools. And so um, to keep it from spreading, the second strategy, um, we're doing things like testing people when they're symptomatic, using physical distancing and facial coverings, as Dr. Raska mentioned. And then finally, when we do see cases in schools, um, preventing the further spread of that. And that is managed through the health department's contact tracing efforts, which we've demonstrated over the last months to be robust and able to um, take on situations as they arise. Uh, so we'll continue to monitor the epi data, but we are in a different place in Vermont than when we closed schools back in March and we're in a different place right now than the, the states that are seeing large increases. We understand more about this virus and how it's transmitted and by whom. We have robust testing capacity available and a robust contact tracing system in place to deal with situations when we see them. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was supposed to introduce Commissioner Pichek.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Calso, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, as a reminder for those, uh, again, who are watching at home, today's presentation is available on our department's website, uh, dfr.vermont.gov, along with resources from our modeling partners. Um, as everyone knows, we have not only been closely monitoring our data here in Vermont, uh, but we are also keeping a close eye on the regional uh, and national data as well. It's been uh, critical to keep this perspective because, as we all know, Vermont is not an island and neither is the Northeast. There is always a risk that what is happening in other parts of the country could have a direct impact on us here in Vermont. And as the governor said, the COVID-19 picture nationally uh, is certainly concerning. We have seen a steady rise in cases over the last month uh, with our country routinely reporting over 50,000 cases on a daily basis. To put this into some perspective, just over the last 10 days, the United States has reported more COVID-19 cases than the entire population of Vermont. We can see that this growth is concentrated largely in the southern part of the United States, with new cases now far eclipsing the totals we saw here in the Northeast in March and in April. But we're also seeing growth in the Midwest and the West, illustrated, illustrating just how interconnected we are as a country. To help us illustrate this, we have taken our travel map that we apply here to our uh, states and counties in the Northeast. and maintain that same threshold across the entire country from the beginning of the pandemic. Similar to the heat map we presented a few weeks ago, the travel map shows that cases at the beginning were clustered largely in the Northeast and a few other parts of our country before receding here and then spreading again throughout the South, West, and Midwest. Today, it covers much of the country. And in fact, just 15% of US counties would meet our criteria for non-quarantine county or non-quarantine travel into Vermont today. Again, like we mentioned, what is happening across the country can have a direct impact on us here in the Northeast. Since the middle part of May, we had been reporting a decline in week over week numbers of new cases in the Northeast. However, last week, we did break that trend with cases increasing just over 1%. That trend continues this week with cases in the Northeast increasing by 9.74% compared to last week. But again, as the governor and Dr. Kelso pointed out, this is simply a backdrop to what others are experiencing. And here in Vermont, our trends continue to be steady as we look at our four restart metrics. The percentage of Vermonters visiting emergency rooms or urgent care facilities to report COVID-like symptoms remains stable this week. And today we sit at just 0.87%, well below our 4% guardrail. Our three and seven day viral growth averages also held steady this week, all trending safely below 1% and not demonstrating the sort of sustained growth that would give us concern. Again, regarding pest test positivity, our rolling average is also under 1% this week, again, safely below our 5% guardrail. Our fourth metric is hospital and critical care bed availability. And like we've seen in recent weeks, uh, this continues to trend close to our 30% buffer. Uh, and today, in fact, we are exceeding it. However, as we've pointed out in the past, our non-ICU capacity remains high. And generally, with our other numbers trending well, uh, this is not a concern at this time. I'd like to turn now to our travel map uh, and particularly highlight some visual improvements that we're making to the travel map this week. You can see the map generally has a cleaner uh, appearance that more distinctly outlines the borders of the states that it applies to. But we also made uh, a change to this platform because this will make the map more accessible to those who access it on smartphones or tablets. And most importantly, this platform will easily allow us to include Canadian health districts once the US-Canada border uh, is open so that they can be measured by the same standard we're applying uh, here in the Northeast. Again, I just want to provide basically a simple overview of, of what this map was trying to accomplish and, and provide uh, the, the information for the update this week. We really were trying to measure what is the experience of the virus in certain parts of the area around us. Uh, if those areas were seeing improvement, the map would expand. 
if those areas were seeing worsening case counts, the map would contract. Uh, and that's exactly what we've seen happen over the last four or five weeks. Here in New England, we started out with about 3.6 million uh, that people that were able to come to Vermont without quarantine. That number increased to about 4.6 million, uh, then went up again to about 6.4 million uh, before pretty much staying steady. Uh, we dropped a little bit last week uh, down to about 6 million. And this week we stand at, again, 5.5 million. So you can see that the, the Northeast has opened up, remained somewhat steady, but has seen a decline. Again, when we look at the entire travel map picture, it does paint something a little bit different. Uh, we did start with about 19 million people that were not subject to quarantine. That number went down to about 13.5 million people. Uh, it then went down further to about 11.5 million people, standing today uh, at 6.9 million people. So again, I think this well il illustrates how the map uh, can both expand and contract uh, based on the experiences that other states are having. And as we pointed out earlier in the presentation, uh, we are seeing incre increased, increased case growth across the Northeast. Uh, so that's something uh, that is important uh, to keep in mind. We also wanted to provide uh, a comparison of how our travel map uh, matches up with some of the other approaches taken uh, in the region and across the globe as well. Uh, we applied the metrics that New York, uh, Connecticut, and New Jersey are using on a statewide basis uh, for the states in the United States uh, on a county level basis here in the, here in the Northeast. And you can see quite significantly uh, how that is a very different picture uh, than what we have here uh, in Vermont standard. Similarly, when you apply our standard to the EU standard, uh, you can see theirs is more conservative, but on a whole, uh, the Vermont metrics line up more closely with this more conservative approach, which is really um, what we were uh, attempting to accomplish, balancing the important uh, interests of health and safety of Vermonters uh, with the important tourism industry that's critical to our economy overall. And we continue to uh, see the map respond in that way. So with that, I would uh, now like to um, turn the program back over to Governor Scott. I was not just elected governor. <laughs> I'm going to wrap up this portion of the press conference with an update on the reports of the 59 people who had positive antigen test results from Manchester Medical Center. So far, as of late last evening, we know that 17 of the 59 people have since had a PCR test performed, which is recommended to confirm the positive antigen result. Of the 17 people, 15 tested negative, two were positive. What does this mean? Although our investigation is not complete, it appears that many of the positive antigen results reported by Manchester Medical Center might have been false positives. There have been a lot of questions about the difference between antigen tests and PCR tests and how they're used. So once again, I'll just go into that. PCR tests are the most common type of test used to diagnose or confirm COVID-19 infection, and it is the test used by our public health laboratory. Antigen tests are a newer type of test, only recently approved by the FDA, that provide results much more quickly than PCR tests. They are intended as screening tools for people who have symptoms. And while they are a useful tool for screening patients, Antigen tests may have a higher chance of missing an active infection and need to be confirmed. Positive antigen tests must be reported to the health department for follow-up. The CDC, WHO, and the Association of Public Health Laboratory guidelines do not recommend antigen testing for people without symptoms. Studies on antigen tests have only been done on people with symptoms. We don't have evidence about the accuracy of the antigen test on people without symptoms. It might turn out to be a great test for everyone, but we just don't know. And antigen tests should only be administered if there's capacity to confirm antigen negatives with PCR. There are a number of possibilities about the current situation, 
but many of the 59 people who tested positive with the antigen test did not have symptoms. Other factors that potentially could play a role might be systematic factors related to the performance of the test or the time elapsed between the two tests. Again, the antigen test is recommended to be used for people with symptoms by the CDC and the Association of Public Health Laboratories. Studies on antigen tests have only been done on people with symptoms. We don't have evidence about the accuracy of the test on people without symptoms. Finally, I also want to share some details about testing efforts on folks within the community. The health department offered testing to the public on Wednesday in Londonderry, and Southern Vermont Medical Center has offered testing in Manchester yesterday and today, and will come back as needed. So far, our lab has reported that all 405 specimens analyzed from these initial test efforts in the community were negative. This is a good indication that these cases are not spreading within the community. Remember, we know of two positive cases, only two, though there may be more. We continue to investigate the situation and are treating all positive antigen tests the same as any positive case, reaching out to each person, giving them guidance to isolate, tracing their contacts, and above all, recommending that they get a confirmatory PCR test. Our epidemiology team has succeeded in reaching all but 11 of the 59 people with positive antigen tests. So far, we have not found connections that would cause us to call this an outbreak. We are learning more about antigen tests, and they are a useful tool for screening patients who do have symptoms. But our recent PCR results are showing us why they need to be confirmed so we have a more accurate picture of current infection in patients. Please remember, if you're concerned that you may have been exposed to someone who has tested positive, please contact your health care provider to see if you should be tested. And to conclude, I again ask everyone to continue to follow the same simple actions as all Vermonters to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Wear a face mask around others if you are able. Keep six feet apart. Wash your hands frequently and stay home when you're sick. Now we'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Um, with that, we'll open it up for questions. We'll start with Calvin. All right, thank you. So, um, Governor, new unemployment numbers out today show uh, that it's fallen about three points from May to June. Um, I'm wondering if you and maybe Commissioner Harrington can weigh in on this, but whether we can expect that to see or whether we can expect that to decline, or if we maybe plateau in terms of unemployment, especially since we haven't really opened up the state. Uh, yeah. Uh, very difficult to determine. Obviously, good news that it's declining and, and moving in the right direction, uh, but we still have 50,000 uh, Vermonters unemployed on either traditional unemployment or uh, the PUA. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. Um, again, it depends on, on how the pandemic uh, unfolds and uh, whether it has any effect on us here and whether we can continue to open up uh, the economy so that people can get back to work, which is of great concern to me. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, anything you can offer on that? Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, the only thing I would add, uh, I think you hit on all the, the major parts. Um, it will depend on uh, both what happens in our state, but also within our region and across the country. Um, and uh, it's going to be a slow process. Uh, it was good to see that the the rate has come down uh, in the most recent jobs report uh, between May and June, and we hope that trend continues, um, but there are still a large number of people um, collecting unemployment, and, um, and it'll be a slow process over the coming months as those people are able to go back to work. And just a quick follow-up, so uh, within the next couple of weeks, um, the $600 that Vermont has been receiving, that will run out 
I'm just wondering how the state is preparing for maybe you know, people not being able to pay their rent or their bills or, you know, for, uh, I guess, yeah, we'll, we'll, without that $600. Yeah, again, it's a concern. The additional $600 uh, was beneficial to many here in Vermont. It kept us stabilized uh, so that they could continue to pay their rent. And we uh, also had uh, uh, some other provisions in our economic recovery bill uh, as well uh, that would help in that in that way. Um, so what I'm hearing, and, and I, you know, there's no way to really know, but uh, Congress is uh, taking a look at this. Uh, there may be some action. Uh, I'm not sure that it would be the full $600, but there may be a move uh, to do something less. But, uh, but again, that might be a better question for our congressional delegation uh, at this point. Um, in terms of preparing, again, uh, we're doing all we can here in Vermont to, to keep Vermonters safe, uh, to keep opening up the economy as much as we can. Uh, but we, we do uh, rely on the region. We do rely on the rest of the country in terms of how they're doing. And uh, so, uh, again, when I see, uh, I'm concerned about what I'm seeing in the uh, south and west of our country, as well as uh, how it's migrating a bit towards the northeast, uh, although nothing to worry about at this point, uh, but we're always trying to anticipate that. And uh, so we want, again, things to get back to normal. Uh, but until there's a vaccine, um, until we can really control this, uh, it's going to be, um, you know, something we have to keep an eye out on. Governor, are you uh, confident that the troubles with the Labor Department and filing for unemployment benefits, um, technical um, challenges and stuff, has that been resolved now? Are you satisfied? Well, within reason, yes. Um, we, uh, we are overwhelmed at first, admittedly. Uh, we had our share of problems with callbacks and and with a system uh, that wasn't uh, designed for this capacity. Uh, but we found ways to work around that, uh, give great credit to the Labor Department as well as the Tax Department for working together and trying to come up with a PUA assistance. That's been beneficial, and that's been almost uh, seamless. Um, but uh, but the, the problems still um, are there. Uh, we have a mainframe uh, that uh, needs to be replaced. Uh, it's uh, 50 years old. Uh, it's going to continue to be a problem in the in the foreseeable future. Um, we're hoping uh, that on a federal level, uh, because we're not the only state that is, is experiencing this. In fact, I mean, if you if you reach out and and see uh, some of the other states, we're far ahead of, of where they are. Um, we we're one of the leaders in the country. As many problems as we had initially, uh, at this point in time, uh, things are going fairly well uh, from that standpoint. So. Uh, I give, uh, again, great credit to our team, our expanded team, because it wasn't just the Labor Department, which did yeoman's work and working seven days a week to get through this, uh, but also some of our other agencies and departments that stepped up to help, whether it was the VTRANS or Department of Financial Regulation, uh, Department of Motor Vehicle, and uh, Tax Department, and others who just uh, sent people in uh, to help out. So uh, I thought it was a, a good joint effort and um, is part of what I see as an expanded team that works together uh, to try and help when others need it. And if I could follow up with Dr. Levine on the Manchester case, if I understood you correctly, of the 59, uh, you've reached all but 11. Uh, so that leaves 48, and you only have results for 17 of those 48. So do you know enough yet to say that this is not a concern? Uh, or that this was a false alarm, or do you just not know enough yet? Yeah, obviously I'd prefer to have greater than 27% or so sample size to be more reassuring, but at the same time, um, clearly the data is trending in the direction that um, we have a large number of asymptomatic people, and they don't appear to have a positive PCR test, and the interviews are bearing that out. But um, I don't think it'll be a long amount of time before we can offer more because so much testing is happening as we speak. So stay tuned. Will you have more today or not today, do you think? Uh, potentially more today, but generally the way these work uh, over a six to eight hour cycle, it could be very late in the afternoon and into the early evening. <clears throat> Moving to the phones, Joe, Barton Chronicle. 
Hello, Governor. Um, I've had a number of calls from readers who are concerned about uh, news reports saying that uh, the federal government has asked for data about hospitals, uh, admissions, and various factors connected with the COVID pandemic to be sent not to uh, the CDC, but to a separate database. And what they're curious about is whether the state also receives that data. I think the concern is that it uh, be kept in a, by someone they trust. Yeah, uh, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. So we're, we're all trying to sort through this right now because um, if you begin to read, uh, you see concerns about politicizing of this data, taking it out of the CDC, moving it to HHS, but you also see some reports about perhaps the platforms and the data platforms uh, weren't robust enough and they will be more robust with the move. I was fortunately on a phone call with uh, the uh, leaders of medical centers around the state and with the head of their uh, association of hospitals and health systems who conveyed to me the knowledge that the hospital association nationwide actually is not concerned about this um, and does not feel that data is not going to be appropriately protected. So um, this is all like breaking news essentially, so we don't have the final word um, to understand it as best we'd like to. But on both sides now, we're seeing that there may be actually reasonable reasons for this to have happened uh, without concerns, but still some expressing some level of concern that uh, we have to respect, but we don't know how it's gonna play out just yet. But, but Vermont's data doesn't go through the states then. It goes directly from hospitals to uh, the federal government. Um, that I'm not 100% sure of um, in terms of the, okay. you're, you're trying to see if it probably would simultaneously come to us as, and, the, and the feds as opposed to just directly to the feds. Okay, so. I think Commissioner Peachock uh, may have an answer to that. Just that we get it. We do. Yeah. So we do, he's confirmed, we do get it directly as well. Okay, that's exactly what I wanted to know. Thank you very much. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Thank you. Um, this is for uh, Governor Scott. The, the CDC now says that if all Americans wore masks for the next eight weeks, we get control. And Dr. Raska was earlier noting the success of universal masking. In light of this, is the state having any, does the administration having any, any discussions about mandating mask wearing? And I have another question. Yeah, it's always been, you know, a tool in the toolbox. Um, and there's no disagreement uh, in terms of the use of masks. Uh, my only um, resistance has been uh, whether making it mandatory makes it self. Um, I think we both want compliance. Um, but just just waving the magic wand and saying uh, instantaneously that uh, yeah, Vermonters must wear masks, again, doesn't necessarily uh, make uh, this uh, compliant, um, or many Vermonters compliant. So, you know, it's always been uh, in the tools, um, toolbox, so to speak, and uh, I'm continuing to, uh, to watch the numbers. Right now, the numbers don't warrant it, but Again, what I'm seeing uh, across the, the country, um, certainly what's happening, you know, as it migrates uh, towards the Northeast, it's another measure we could put in place uh, if we have to, and we might just do that. Um, but, um, but again, uh, it's really, you know, no disagreement on the use of masks. I think uh, everyone should be uh, wearing a mask, and I've said that numerous times over the last few weeks. Uh, it's just a question of whether the compliance would increase if we made it mandatory, or if, if there would just be more frustration and friction and resistance. Uh, another question, uh, we're hearing that houses in the area, especially in the resort sections of the area, are being rented by the weekend um, to people from out of state by large vacation rental companies. And I'm wondering, 
is there a way the state is monitoring this and, and so they, that it's understood that by these companies uh, what the state's regulations are? Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'm, we do monitor in some capacity. We have guidelines uh, for that monitoring. Um, I might ask uh, Deputy Secretary Brady or Commissioner Sherling if uh, they have anything to add to that. Sure, thanks, Governor. Uh, this is Ted Brady. Uh, I think the number one thing we're doing is educating people, and we're doing that by educating those large national platforms like Airbnb uh, and VRBO, but also by educating uh, the owners of properties across the state about what the rules are and what the laws are. And also, uh, you know, our, our guidelines specifically require uh, the, the lodging properties to uh, have customer certified they've met the uh, quarantine requirements or the travel policy requirements that we have and they require them uh, and they, we've provided a an actual certification form so that everybody that comes to the district lodging property is looking and understanding that they have to attest to these specific measures of our travel policy I, I went on a, uh, a website for a large um, international vacation rental uh, company today, and they have something like 300 homes in Vermont that are available for rental by the day. And um, I couldn't find anything that said anything about any uh, restrictions, regulations, guidelines, anything on that. Excellent. Well, we'd, we'd love to know about that specific case, and you can uh, contact the agency of commerce and contact me, and we'll uh, follow up on it. Thanks. Yeah, Sean, if you Thank can you. provide that information, that'd be, be helpful to us so that we could follow up. Will do. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Dr. Levine, uh, if we can start with a follow up. Uh, you had a pending question from last Friday and last Tuesday. You said you'd have an answer for us today. You're referring to the uh, fire, uh, Marshal, Mr. Yeah, we were, we were discussing the ongoing refusal or lack of cooperation by some of the police, fire, and rescue to come into compliance and reporting to emergency management, and in particular, what your contract tracers have documented in their investigations, including what happened at the Vermont Fire Academy. Right, so the Vermont Fire Academy incident, actually, uh, we're uh, quite comforted by the uh, reports we got from the Department of Public Safety and the Commissioner that there was no significant incident that occurred. The individual uh, did not remain on the premises for a very long time, um, and there was no need for any follow-up public health investigation because there was no significant public health issue. Um, we have not been having abundant need to investigate other uh, public safety officials, if you will. Um, quite frankly, you know, we, would, we wouldn't be going out looking for these uh, incidents. These would be something that uh, we were alerted to and hence had to follow up on. I think what I'd like to say, though, in general, is our public safety officials are really heroes. They clearly are first-line contact with people who may or may not harbor the virus and be able to transmit the virus, and we should applaud them for that. Uh, they put themselves into circumstances that most of us don't need to uh, on a daily basis. No, I agree with you 100% on that, but it's interesting that, me, I mean, if if in fact they're in the front line, if they have in fact been contact, come in contact with something. I mean, there was a news story about the eight volunteer firefighters down in Heinsberg that uh, had to go into self-quarantine. And, and I mean, what do you do concerning those eight? Right, so I mean, when those situations occur, uh, we, we, we make our recommendation, which may well be quarantine based on uh, the degree of contact and the duration of contact with the individuals. Um, and whenever anybody is asked to be in quarantine, they're invited to use the SARA alert system to connect with us and uh, get the proper uh, education and advice that they need and reporting mechanism on a daily basis. Um, so 
just like any other Vermonter, they would uh, have access to that and be involved in that system. Um, again, that system is not one that we uh, police everyone and track their movements every moment of the day. Uh, we've discussed that at press conferences previously where that's not the way uh, we do that in this country using apps that would uh, monitor their behavior and check their compliance. It would seem that in the Heinsberg case, and I don't know how much you guys did on that one, or the Rutland City Police, that there would be your contract tracers would be reaching out to them and doing full investigations. Just wondering what your investigations have shown concerning those cases and any others. Uh, so far, we we've been told no case, no public safety agency has been reported uh, or self-reported. Uh, even the, I think the Heinsberg and the Rutland. But <clears throat> yeah, I have no no further information to give you on those. Okay, thank you, <clears throat> Governor Scott. Uh, you probably saw earlier this week, uh, former uh, Vermont National Guard supply sergeant was sentenced in federal court in connection with stealing about one hundred eighty thousand dollars worth of taxpayer property from his job. And the uh, Vermont National Guard gave the sergeant a general discharge under honorable conditions, court papers say. And earlier this year, another National Guardsman was sentenced uh, for stealing C4 explosives. And he was hoping to stay in the Guard until he made his 20 year mark. Just wondering what those two cases and any others that you might be aware of show about the level of discipline currently at the Vermont National Guard. And, I know the Guard has a lot of good people, but it appears there are some bad actors. And just wondering what these kind of cases say about the current discipline over there. Yeah, I didn't see the results of uh, that case in, out of uh, Rutland, I believe it was. Uh, but I remember the case uh, when, it was, uh, un when it was unfolding. Um, I have a great deal of uh, respect and appreciation uh, for the Guard in particular. And uh, as you said, we have a lot of great people there. Uh, those who step up, put their lives on the line to help all of us. I mean, you can see what's happened with the National Guard through this pandemic, um, all the good uh, work that they've done and continue to do, even with the uh, the tracing or the, uh, the testing um, strategy. Uh, they had their, uh, I think, their 10,000th uh, test uh, this past week. Um, so they're a vital part uh, of our recovery uh, in any emergency we have. Um, General Knight um, has again drawn a bit of a line in the sand uh, and uh, since uh, over the last year or so uh, he's been able to accomplish a lot in his expect expectations and I have uh, great faith in, uh, in what he's doing, what his team is doing uh, as we move forward. But with any entity, with any sector, um, there, it isn't perfect and, um, and, and people aren't perfect either. Uh, so there are uh, some isolated incidents, and uh, we hope uh, to keep them to a minimum or to eradicate them if we can. But um, but at this point in time, I think their track record is uh, is pretty remarkable. Yeah, we we tried to get uh, General Knight, but uh, the guard has not made him available this week. And uh, um, but two bad cases there where the one guy's trying to stay in the guard just to get a 20 year pin, whatever, and benefits and everything like that. I mean, you're the commander in chief technically, just wondering if you think that's acceptable. Well, again, I haven't spoken to him directly about uh, uh, either of those cases. And I haven't spoken to him this week uh, since the that decision uh, came down. So um, I, will, I will do so. Uh, if there's anything different, uh, that I can expand upon, I will. Um, but um, but at this point in time, I haven't spoken to him. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Kat, WCAX. Hi. This question is for both Tamisha Rapitek and Dr. Levine, since I think you both been briefed on the material. I've been following the research from the University of Vermont Larner College of Medicine. Their most recent study of about 500 people used both the PCR and serology testing, as well as a survey to measure how prevalent the virus may have been in Chittenden County. They found in their sample about 2% of those people had antibodies to the coronavirus. 
extrapolated to the county as a whole, that would mean potentially 3,600 people in Chittenden County could have been exposed to COVID-19. Uh, so far, we only know of 660 or so that were tested with the PCR and got, got a positive result. It's about 18% of the potential cases. Should we be doing more studies like this on a larger scale in Vermont so that we get a sense of how widespread the virus may have been? I'll start, Kat. Thank you for the question. I'm glad you got to this study in your in basket or your inbox quicker than I did because I haven't read the full study yet, uh, although I'm part of the uh, steering committee. The um, 2% number is very comforting to me. Uh, I've been talking uh, for months now about the level of uh, virus in our state and um, concerns about um, needing to do more serology testing, antibody testing, to figure out what level we're really at. Um, and I've been using some national data talking about places like hot spots within New York City in the 20 plus percent range, um, places like um, that are active but not quite as hot as New York City, still being in the teens percent uh, for what they believe was their contact with the virus. Um, I've kind of steadfastly assumed and held steady with a below 5% number for Vermont. Um, which you know has big implications for a lot of things, but we've usually been discussing it within the context of achieving herd immunity. Herd immunity is 60, 70 percent. Uh, so the bottom line was we're trying to protect Vermonters uh, from uh, any of the significant complications of having this virus or even getting ill with this virus because we know that the majority of them have never seen the virus. Uh, would be eligible for a vaccine when it's developed and clearly uh, aren't going to be comforted uh, into stopping using the masking, stopping the physical distancing because of the fact that they feel we've got a lot of immunity in the population. We have very little immunity in the population. Um, one thing that could be uh, invoked is another type of study uh, bigger than what UVM uh, is doing called the seroprevalence study. And we have actually discussed that with CDC. Um, since our state epidemiologist is here, uh, maybe she'll just make a quick comment about that because we've been discussing that internally uh, over time uh, as these questions about serology testing continue to come up. Thanks, Dr. Levine. It would be ideal to have a zero survey where we could randomly sample a proportion of the Vermont population at a statewide level and see how many have antibodies. Um, it would give us an indication of what we've seen in Vermont um, with virus transmission over the past months and um, you know, how much vaccine we might need. Um, the challenge is uh, a couple things. Um, we don't yet know a lot about antibodies and whether they're protective against the future infection or for, um, for how long they may be protective. Um, and we honestly just haven't had the resources to stand up that kind of a study given the challenges with um, doing the PCR testing and contact tracing that we've been focused on. So I would love to have that data. Uh, we simply don't have it. Um, the Red Cross is testing uh, blood donors to see if they have antibodies. And so we've gotten some results from that. Um, and again, those results on a small number, very small number of Vermonters also indicate a similarly low proportion of Vermonters having antibodies. So UVM developed their own serology test that is far cheaper to administer and has a pretty high accuracy rate according to the researchers I spoke with. Would the state be considering uh, using the serology test that they developed given their findings about its accuracy and its lower cost and of course the fact that it's, you know, Vermont and supporting Vermont researchers? We, we certainly, you know, have partnered with them uh, interested in this study and interested in the results um, and understand that the test platform they were using um, and indeed they've been part of um, our antibody 
serology testing work group that's been making recommendations to us uh, every several weeks. Um, the last time they met, uh, their recommendation was uh, obviously not to use these for individual decision making, but again, to consider a seroprevalence study, but with the caveat that we should be able to piggyback on or partner with a larger study that was already in effect and hopefully involve Vermont residents uh, and get Vermont data from that study. Uh, so the study that you're just uh, quoting today uh, was only meant to be the sample size it, it was, uh, to, to have uh, the power to show what it's going to show. Uh, it wasn't meant to be this more expansive, larger, uh, and potentially more expensive study on a larger population. And the state has no plans to implement a larger study on the population yet? Not, not independently, for sure. We have, to, we have actually broached the subject with CDC, uh, but they're, they're not poised to, to help us with that yet either. Thank you. Ed, Newport Daily Express. Hey, good day. I just a couple of questions on a topic, and that is um, if a person receives a, uh, a false positive test, and they probably just get tested and they find out that the first test is false positive, do you go back and readjust the data? Uh, we are not counting um, probable cases in our case counts that we report um, at the state and federal level. Uh, so we, we are not in a position where with the Manchester cases we need to retract anything at this point. Um, we are waiting to count those as cases until we have um, either a confirmatory lab result or they meet um, you know, a, a case definition that, that allows us to report them. But, Right now, we're only reporting out um, confirmed cases, not probable cases. We're still following up on probable cases with all the appropriate public health recommendations and follow-up. We're just not reporting those counts. We're encouraging testing with PCR, which um, would lead to a confirmatory diagnosis and counting those cases. recorded the Ed, you're not there. Ed, can you? When you come back, I'm sorry. Ed, could you repeat the question? We we only got about a third of that. Okay, I know of a gentleman in a small community who tested this positive, and it showed up on the data. He later tested uh, negative, so it was a false positive. So I'm asking is. Once you have that confirmation data, then you go back and readjust the number. I, I can, uh, I'll let Dr. Levine answer uh, specifically and correct me if I'm wrong, but when I receive the da data on a daily basis, uh, there are times when I see corrections made uh, when something uh, comes out a false positive or whatever it was, uh, they will make a, a correction uh, to, the, to the record, so to speak. I'll let Dr. Levine answer. I think the governor's answered that pretty well. Um, obviously, we, we have a whole epidemiology and health surveillance division that is very data-driven, and their job is to uh, gather and analyze the data. So there are times that uh, you may see a number on the website changing or not changing. Sometimes that has to do with what the state of residence was of the individual who tested positive. Uh, or other aspects of their case. Um, it's hard to generalize. It, it, so it does happen, but it's not okay. frequent. Okay, as a follow-up, because um, any of the testing you're using does have a failure rate, if a person with asymptomatic test positive, should there be a protocol to run a second test to verify that it wasn't a false positive? Yeah, so as Dr. Kelso was alluding to, there is a broader case definition um, that decides if a case is 
presumptive, probable, confirmed. Um, we generally uh, accept a positive PCR test as a positive PCR test as our standard and uh, do the appropriate case investigation surrounding that. Okay, thank you very much. Wilson, the AP. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Um, another question about the antigen test and their use in, uh, in Manchester. Given all the background, I guess, Dr. Levine, that you provided on their use, um, do you think they were used uh, properly in Manchester? Did you get the question, Dr. Levine? Okay. Yeah, were they used properly is the bottom line. Yeah, so again, um, we're dealing with an incomplete sample size at this point in time, so it's very hard for me to generalize 100% uh, across all 59. All I could tell you is of the ones that we have negative PCR tests on, the majority of them had um, no symptoms or no COVID appropriate symptoms for the case definition. And um, we'll see when we have hopefully the entire 59 assessed, maybe better able to answer that question. But didn't you say that uh, uh, the antigen tests are not supposed to be used with people without or asymptomatic patients or potential patients? Right. And uh, it seems, it, it, that's correct, right? So if a lot of the people were asymptomatic in using this test, and if, uh, I don't, I don't know if you want to consider it a failure rate or an accuracy rate, but two out of 17, that seems like a pretty high percentage. No, I'm completely that with you. Yeah, I'm completely with you. I'm trying to, you know, think about the factors that as positive tests were reported in the community and people getting concerned and more people showing up and wanting to have a test, um, um, that demand was there. Um, I can't say much more. Um, I will just stand by what I said, that it is not a recommended test to be used for an asymptomatic population, especially an asymptomatic population in a low prevalence setting. And Vermont continues to be a low prevalence setting, uh, further confirmed by what Kat just mentioned about the 2% zero prevalence rate in the state. Uh, but certainly supported by our PCR testing efforts and the percent positivity we have around the state. So um, it wouldn't be a, an appropriate test. I, I guess I could mention that, you know, this test is being um, used a little bit more broadly now uh, because it's, it's out, it's been approved. Um, and I know that from an employer standpoint, it's often considered as a test to reassure the employer that their employees who may be public facing are not infected and to reassure their, uh, the public that frequents them uh, that they're not dealing with infected individuals. Probably would not be the best use of that test based on what we know about it because most of the employees by definition if they're showing up for work would not be symptomatic. So would they be falsely reassured by having a uh, negative test because um, they got a negative result. Um, probably not the best time to use the test. Uh, but its convenience is uh, the other countervailing factor that I'm sure is making it uh, very popular because you can tell the employee within 15 minutes if they test positive or negative. Uh, but this should be, you know, I'm sure the FDA is looking at this across the country now and uh, realizing the kind of use the machines are getting, and if it turns out that they're getting used a lot for asymptomatic populations, um, may have to weigh in on that. Certainly, if you use it in an asymptomatic population in Florida right now, um, that's a very high prevalent setting, uh, so things may turn out differently than they would in a state like Vermont. Okay, thank you very much. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, uh, I don't know if this is for Dr. Levine and Dr. Kelso, but there seems to be some confusion in the public when it comes to antigen versus antibody tests. 
uh, people seem to be conflating the two, and it's kind of understandable because even if you Google antigen test, you'll get results for antibody tests in the search. Uh, so can someone explain what the difference is between those two? Sure, I'll take a crack and defer to the medical doctors. Um, uh, antigen tests, like PCR tests, look for a current or um, active infection. They detect bits of the virus itself in the, the swab that was taken from the nose. Um, antibodies, on the other hand, are what we produce in response to having an infection. And with some diseases like measles, antibodies last for a long time. Um, a lifetime likely and protect against future infection. Uh, with other diseases like influenza, uh, they're less robust, they don't last as long, they um, don't protect very well against future infections, and that's partly why we need a flu vaccine every year. So antibodies are what our bodies produce in response to being infected and can prevent against future infection. Antigen or PCR tests look for the virus itself. So one is the antigen um, and PCR are looking for current infection while antibodies can tell us we were infected at some point in the past but not when. And, and, and serology is a blood test whereas uh, antigen and other PCR tests are um, typically a nasal or throat swab. And I'm getting the thumbs up so we'll leave it there. Okay, um, and I, I don't know if anyone there has any information, but it seems like um, there hasn't been, it seems like there's a big question about these antibodies and if they will stick around and there's been talk of maybe antibodies only being good for a few months and that this will turn into a kind of a every kind of season kind of vaccine. Do we have any information on that in Vermont? Uh, we're going to give uh, Dr. Raska an opportunity to get to the podium. <laughs> So we don't have that information in Vermont. There is some international data about that, and the original uh, information came out of China. And in that situation, 37 symptomatic Chinese adults were hospitalized in a particular hospital, and 37 infected but non-symptomatic, asymptomatic adults were hospitalized per protocol in China. And they measured neutralizing antibodies over time. And neutralizing antibodies are the same thing that Dr. Kelso talked about, but very, very specific in the sense that we think they're binding to very particular pieces of the virus. And that study demonstrated that if you were symptomatic, that 42 days after onset of infection, 90% of the time, you still had antibodies. However, if you were asymptomatic, meaning that you were hospitalized because of code infection but had no signs of symptoms, only 50% of those adults still had persistence of antibodies. So that was a little bit concerning. There is another study that was just, I'm not sure it's actually been peer reviewed yet, it's just been released out of Italy, suggesting particularly again, that these antibodies arise reasonably quickly. By three weeks, most people have antibodies, but they are waning in that by two to three months, there has been decay rates. So everyone's looking at this to see what are the implications for future infections and even for vaccinology. Thank you. If I could just, Eric, uh, just from a layperson's perspective and what I've learned over the last uh, four or five months is, you know, this is such a new virus uh, that the science is evolving and, and unfolding right before our eyes, so they're learning more every single day. We've learned more every single day, and I think it's just too early uh, for anyone to come to any any conclusion uh, that you can count on. So I, I, I believe they're working at it, and uh, and hopefully we'll learn more uh, as time goes on, but, um, but everyone is trying to come up with a vaccine, plus learn more about what it means when you've been infected. Thank you, Governor. Liam, VPR. Hi, um, this question for um, Commissioner Levine. I'm just wondering a little bit about why it's taken 
uh, most of the weekend, you're, we still don't even know or have been able to test all the 59 folks in the Manchester region who had the antigen test. Just, I guess, what's taken so long and when do you expect to have all this complete? Yeah, actually, I think things are moving along pretty briskly, but that's my perspective. But the bottom line is, uh, you know, we had testing Wednesday, we had testing yesterday, we have testing today. We're hoping to capture all of these 59. Um, needless to say, we can't go to their home, grab them by the arm and say, go get tested. Uh, so I can't even guarantee to you that we will have all 59 tested. Um, but that's our goal and that's the uh, counsel we're giving all of them. Um, you need to understand that once the test is done, it's been collected probably between nine and three o'clock during a day. Then it has to be transported several hours north uh, to either the public health lab or the UVM lab. And then it has to be run as an assay. Uh, and if it comes in too late on the, on the day that the testing uh, was collected, the specimen was collected, it will be run the next day. And there's a six to eight hour process that needs to be gone through uh, for the testing to actually occur. So um, there are, you know, there's still an opportunity, and I'll stand by this, for those tests, when they are collected on a Wednesday, they will be run on a Thursday. Um, if they actually got back early enough on a Wednesday, some of them could be run on Wednesday. But generally, they'll be run on Thursday, so the results will be out by the evening uh, of the Thursday. So it's as, it's as good as it gets, uh, and it's as fast as we can go with this. Um, the, the important point, though, is nobody's health is being put at risk. Everybody who had a positive antigen test was getting the same advice, the same instructions from the health department regarding uh, what they should be doing and not doing. And the contact tracing and interviewing processes were underway. So uh, it's just a matter then of awaiting the result to see if one can change their behavior or not based on if the result comes back positive or negative. Mm -hmm. So did you, I mean, as these tests from Manchester were starting to roll in, I mean, were you, I guess, in real time contact tracing this antigen test and encouraging people to go get the PCR test? I mean, it's, yes. it's a little, I think, unclear and confusing until like at what point did the state see that there was a situation that they needed to step in here? Yeah, so uh, the Manchester Medical Center reported their positive antigen test to us. That is the signal for us to get into gear and connect with the individuals whose test was positive and begin that interview process and any necessary contact tracing. So that happens real time, just as if they had a PCR test positive, we would be notified by the lab that the PCR test is positive and get into gear with the uh, individual who tested positive. So mm -hmm. the, the, public, you know, the public health behavior is not uh, modified or changed whether it was a PCR positive or an antigen positive. We still do the things we need to do and the only additional advice is to make sure that the antigen positive person knows that we would like them to get a PCR confirmation. And just to just be clear, is that uh, the numbers from the state that you're reporting every day, those are reflecting the PCR tests you do, not the antigen tests. Precisely. So out of the 17 that I commented on, there will only be two that show up on our update uh, for new cases from there. 15 will not. I mean, so then I guess what does that kind of do for, for modeling and, and sort of thinking about Vermont's, um, you know, average caseloads and positivity rates? I mean, if we, we have all these antigen tests going on that we're not capturing, uh, you know, like I, I guess I'm, this is maybe more of a modeling question for Commissioner Pichak. I mean, at, at, mm -hmm. at what, how do you take those into consideration if you're seeing all of a sudden a bunch of positives in the antigen tests that could indicate uh, that Vermont is not doing as well as the modeling that you set up? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll let him answer that. Uh, I'll just say, though, that again, um, his modeling is not based on presumptive cases. It's based on confirmed cases. 
So we would want him to have only the data that he needs to have to do that modeling, which is confirmed cases. And Dr. Levine, before you step away, I think another sort of underlying question there that goes to you, rather than Commissioner Pijak, is are there, I mean, Liam indicated there are abundant antigen tests being done. I don't just Yeah, so, so, so far I'm aware of only one other site that's doing antigen tests, though that may be growing if we uh, uh, believe uh, news reports uh, for sure. But I'm not aware of abundant sites across Vermont that are doing the antigen test just yet. Commissioner Pichek, did you have more to add? I think you covered it pretty well. We rely on your data, so. Okay. Yeah, he confirmed. He, he relies on our data, which is confirmed. Cases. All right, thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, I had a, uh, two economic data questions. Uh, one for uh, Commissioner Goldstein and one for Commissioner Harrington. Uh, uh, Commissioner Goldstein, what are the latest numbers for the ACCD and the Tax Department grant numbers, both the, the number of applications and if there's any money left over? And for Commissioner Harrington, uh, I noticed that the labor force declined significantly, and I was wondering if he might have an explanation. Hi, this is Commissioner Goldstein. Thanks, Tim, for the question. Um, so happy to say that uh, as of last night, uh, $33 million was uh, sent out to the tax applications, and that takes care of 800 uh, applicants. Uh, in total, they had a little over 1,500 applicants and on the ACCD side we have about 1,637 in process, 333 were approved and yes there's money left over in both in both programs so we would urge folks to please apply. Um, it's uh, the ACCD is taking a little longer but we will be dispersing checks next week. Uh, thank you. Yeah, regarding uh, the labor force, I think there are a couple different components here that just need to be considered. One, we are seeing um, in terms of unemployment uh, that people are going back to work. Um, there is also um, some of it is uh, in the definitions and what the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, defines as, as labor force. Um, we do know that the number of jobs and, and employers um, has gone up in certain areas. It certainly doesn't outweigh the number of people that were displaced due to COVID. Um, but even in the most recent numbers, we've seen uh, jobs in the leisure and hospitality are up over the month uh, by one, uh, 1,500. Education is up over the month uh, by uh, 0.6,000. So uh, again, the when we look at the total of being down 41.5, that is the, the loss in the employed population um, over the prior uh, over the prior period, um, which is due to the, the layoff uh, and either the closure of businesses or um, the, the loss of those um, those jobs. Is it that's, that's not to say what what may come back uh, over uh, as businesses either reopen um, or um, expand over the coming weeks, months, and years, um, but that is um, remains to be seen at this point. Um, I'm guessing that it doesn't include the uh, USCIS uh, for those that are coming. Correct. It would not include that, and the, the job numbers are compared on a um, a year-to-year -year basis. So when we look back, we're looking back uh, a year, not just the prior month. Well, two things that occurred to me. One is that sometimes that number will, will go down if people mm -hmm. quit looking for work. And the other thing is, that are you still seeing um, layoffs? You know, we sort of thought that the layoffs were coming early in the uh, pandemic, that, that there wouldn't be so many layoffs. But are, are companies reporting to you still uh, fairly significant layoffs? Yeah, so two pieces there that you mentioned. One is um, whether we're talking about jobs or we're talking about um, employed or unemployed individuals. Again, some of that is 
is lost in translation when we talk about the definitions used by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, so again, when we start talking about people who are able and available for work or people who are looking for work, at the same time we, we run into an issue as people aren't necessarily looking for work uh, during this period because they, uh, in, in many cases, are temporarily displaced. Um, due to COVID-19, so it is kind of a weird, um, weird spot we are in uh, at the moment, given the pandemic, because the definitions um, don't t don't necessarily line up with the condition we're faced at this point in time. Um, we do see a continued number of uh, unemployment claims coming through, but um, we are also, and, and many of you may have seen, that the department um, is taking extra efforts now to validate the identity of uh, individuals filing new claims, because we suspect that there is a, a portion of every um, series of new claims that we get, um, there are, are those in that population that are fraudulent. And so we are working to confirm identities on a lot of these. And this is not any different to Vermont than what we're seeing across the country and from our partners in mm -hmm. other states, um, that there is a significant portion of new claims coming in that are um, fraudulent in some way. Uh, and so that's why we're taking extra efforts to, to protect the system and protect um, claimants. Do you have a percentage of what the, the number of fraudulent claims are across the country? We don't. We will. Yeah, we'll know more. I, I don't know across the country. We'll know more uh, as we review the claims on a daily basis. Um, what kind of triggered for us is that we are seeing a consistent amount pretty much every day and every week. Um, and it averages somewhere around 300 uh, at a high to 150 at a low for each day, um, but a, an average of about 1,500 new claims each week. Um, and yet we're not necessarily seeing that in the actual labor market. And so um, now looking at different ways we can validate that information, uh, we had other steps in place, but one, one of the pieces we're wanting to employ now is actually reaching out to all of those new claimants to validate their ID. Uh, and I can tell you uh, just in, in recent days, you know, sometimes um, we'll call a number and it goes to a hotel room. Um, sometimes we'll call a number, it may be out of the country. Um, so again, I, it's not uncommon based on what we're hearing from other states that there are a, a portion of new claims coming into each state that are fraudulent in some way. All right, great, thank you. All right, just a quick time check. Uh, we are about an hour into the Q&A portion and only halfway through our list, so just please bear that in mind, folks. Uh, next up is Lisa from the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. Thank you for all the antigen information today. It's super helpful. Is it possible to get the total number of positive antigen tests that have been reported in Vermont? Dr. Kelso. I don't know that off the top of my head, but we'd be happy to get that for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Guy Page. Good morning, Governor. Um, I know the treasurer is the constitutional officer with the most oversight over the state pension fund. But with the state employees retirement fund losing 11% in value during the first quarter of 2020, the unfunded liability may be even higher than the 4.5 billion that's been talked about. Does your, does your administration have a proposal to turn around this long-standing problem of unfunded pension liability? Well, again, this has been an area of concern for all of us, whether it's from the legislature, the treasurer, or the administration. Uh, something that we've been uh, contemplating uh, for quite some time. Um, Dave Coates uh, has brought it to the attention of many uh, over the years. Um, maybe we'll get some attention this year um, because it is uh, losing money, but I'm not sure that uh, any investment at this point in time isn't losing money. So it's not as though it's the only one uh, here in the uh, in the country. But, uh, but obviously it's still a concern and we'll, uh, we've um, We'll continue to work with the legislature and uh, the treasurer in, uh, in ways that we can 
bring that into uh, into uh, reality. What are some of those? What are some of the things that you might put forward, though? Um, too early. Uh, too early at this point, uh, Guy. Um, certainly, I'm not sure that they'll be wanting to take that up in their abbreviated session in August. Mm -hmm. But uh, this will be, I, I'm sure, uh, something that will come up in uh, in January, and depending on who is who is in office at that point in time uh, and uh, what the circumstances look like, uh, we'll, you know, we'll, well, I'm sure it'll come up and, and we'll, uh, we'll try and work together and try and provide relief in any way we can. Thank you. Uh, Chester, Chester Telegraph told us last week that state highway workers removed roadway graffiti saying, quote, BLM is racist. Giving your administration's direction to not remove graffiti that is not profane or grotesque or unsafe to traffic, are you concerned that VTrans may be now selectively eliminating graffiti uh, based on the content of the message? Well, you know, I have any racist comment that we want to remove, are you suggesting that okay. black uh, BLM is is a racist? Is racist isn't a racist comment? I don't know. Uh, I do know there are people who, who have a point of view that says that they, that, that they believe that BLM is racist in some ways. Uh, but my point is that you've got a, a political point of view here uh, that where it seems that VTrans may be discriminating, this message is okay, this message isn't, when the original direction was not profane or grotesque or unsafe to travel. Yeah, inflammatory, so racist. I, you know, I would I would categorize that. Uh, but your your point is well taken. I mean, this isn't a perfect system. Uh, we wanted to alleviate uh, some of the tension uh, here in Vermont across the country that we've seen. Uh, we took this path forward so that we could, uh, you know, tamp this down a bit. I think it was successful. But we're going to have to come up with some provision in the future. I'd be happy. I've, I've spoken to uh, some of the, the legislative uh, uh, folks about this uh, I want to task our, our racial uh, equity uh, task force with this uh, as well to get their input uh, because we have to come to some conclusion about where we go from here. Um, obviously, we want to protect uh, the investments of the state of Vermont. Uh, we don't want to deface everything. We want to, to make sure that we uh, provide uh, equity uh, across, um, across all perspectives. Um, so we'll, this isn't over. I mean, this is something that we're going to uh, have to have some dialogue and discussion about and uh, love to get the uh, legislative uh, input as well. Thank you. Courtney, Local 22. Huh? Go ahead, Courtney. Hi, sorry, I wasn't sure if I was on there. Um, just a quick question for Dr. Levine. Um, I know you had acknowledged in the past that some test results take longer to come back. I was just wondering if that was still the case and how it affects uh, Vermont's testing strategy and if there's any extra attention or priority paid to people with symptoms for getting tested versus people without symptoms for getting tested. There's a lot of questions. I'm hoping I can cover them. Um, I can repeat. So, so the um, we'll start with delay in getting test results. So either that's because the lab isn't processing the test quickly enough, or because the lab processes it, it gets a negative result, and the person doesn't hear about it quickly enough. Uh, so regarding the lab issue, um, unless a specimen is being sent to a private lab, a commercial lab, which often happens in some of the smaller practices in the state who send their specimens directly. To my knowledge, we're not having delays in getting tests done by either the public health lab, the UVM lab, or the lab that UVM predominantly uses for sendouts, which is the Broad Institute in Boston. With regard to actually testing negative and not hearing about it because relying on, on the US mail to arrive at the door, which we've told can sometimes take a long time, 
Um, that has been taken care of very nicely uh, with a totally um, redone call center so that not only will the person's negative result be known quickly to someone who can call the person, but we have extensive hours each day for literally, we're talking well over a thousand phone calls generated every day by the number of negative labs that are coming in. So we now have a bank of people who can help accomplish that. And um, I don't think you're going to hear that uh, people were waiting for the letter, which they'll still get, by the way, um, but not knowing what their news was because they're getting a quicker call. So that was that set of questions. Uh, then you asked about both antibody and antigen. Um, no, just just if there's any priority to people getting tested, um, like getting their results if they have symptoms versus if they're asymptomatic. Okay, so the the largest group that has a priority, if I could put that uh, in front of you, is when we're encountering an outbreak situation, um, like what we're doing right now. Uh, or we have a vulnerable, high-risk population, um, and it would warrant something happening. For instance, if we're testing within a correctional facility, if we're testing in a long-term care or a healthcare-related issue, uh, where that result really needs to be known quickly uh, to protect others and to uh, enable the workforce, etc. So. Um, there are, there are those higher priority groupings, but that doesn't necessarily mean everybody else waits five days till their test is run. Uh, it's just a relative issue where one is run faster than the other. Um, that answers everything. Thank you. Thank you. Ann Wallace Allen, BT Digger. Hi, this is a question for uh, Commissioner Harrington. Um, on the, I'm, I'm still getting emails occasionally from people who say that they're, they haven't been paid benefits or they're not getting their benefits for one reason or another. And I'm just wondering if uh, the DOL has cleared up the backlog or how that's going. And part of it is, uh, and this might be related to fraud, I don't know, but on your insurance summary, you guys have um, th that 107,000 claimants have qualified for benefits and only 92,000 have received benefits. And I was wondering what that discrepancy is. Sure, a couple different pieces. Uh, let me take the first one. Um, th there is no significant backlog um, that uh, remains in the system. All initial claims are being processed. Um, yes, you are correct. There are people either deemed ineligible or due to some um, issue on their claim. Uh, their claim hasn't been processed. Sometimes it is a known issue and that claim is in adjudications or appeals to determine eligibility. Uh, sometimes it's an unknown issue that uh, comes by way of um, uh, something uh, through our mainframe system or another uh, issue we run into. And I think, you know, the governor um, explained this pretty, uh, pretty spot on in the beginning of the press conference that you know, we've, we've done a great job um, using the system that we have in place, but it is not a perfect system. And there are times where um, certain claims get caught up for one reason or another. Um, we're usually able to resolve those uh, within a, a three day period. Um, once they get to a specialist, sometimes we are seeing where people have called our call center and they either get a, a, a mixed answer or um, their issue isn't resolved right away and, and they are able to eventually get to a specialist and we're able to dig into it a little bit more. Um, but to your question, Ann, there, there aren't large populations of people that just aren't being served and, and hanging out in the system. Um, it's usually due to either um, a system related issue um, that has tagged or marked a, a specific claim for non-payment for some reason or um, it's because they are moving through the prescribed process um, but in terms of us having uh, large groups that just aren't being processed um, that's not the case okay with regard um, to your second yeah can you just state that again I, I didn't quite catch the whole thing Sure. On the DOL unemployment insurance summary, uh, it says that 
107,000 claimants have qualified for benefits and 92,000 have received benefits. So my question is, if 107,000 have qualified, that's about 15,000 that haven't received benefits, and I was wondering why. So uh, qualified means they get a, a weekly benefit amount, so they are, are eligible under the monetary determination. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean they are eligible under other parts within that determination. So again, it could be that it's a claim that got caught in our system um, that we're still working through, um, and uh, people are calling our call center to resolve those issues. It could mean that they are going through the prescribed process, but really the eligibility uh, amount in the report simply means that they had wages in our system that made them monetarily eligible, but there are many other reasons why uh, someone may not be eligible for unemployment insurance. Uh, it just means that they reach the monetary threshold. Got it. Thank you. I guess, um, do, you have, do you know how much fraud has cost the DOL since the pandemic started? And yes, I know that this is happening in a lot of states and people were just waiting for something like this to come along. Uh, I don't know a, a definitive number. I think we will know more over the coming weeks. So um, we are working with a vendor. They've done an initial scan of the PUA system and are in the, the middle of doing a scan of the traditional buy system. Uh, and then we will be sending them all new claims on a weekly basis. Um, once we review both of those initial scans um, and and are able to track those claims that they're only identifying potential fraud. We then have to go in and dig in and investigate those to determine if they truly were fraudulent in nature. Um, I mean, I, the one, the one silver lining I would say in this, if there is one, is that um, because of the size of our state, the small size of our state, we won't see numbers um, as big as some other states. Um, because a large bump in claims on a particular day would raise a red flag for us, uh, and we would immediately begin investigating, where in other states they can see a large bump in a day and it doesn't necessarily alert them to, to a specific issue. So um, we do know there have been losses. We do know in our tracking when we come across it, num uh, amounts that have been paid out. Um, some have been recouped. Others are sent to law enforcement. Um, so we do know there have been monies lost. Some of it is federal money coming through the PUA program. Some of it is uh, trust fund money uh, that came through traditional UI. But we'll know more in, in probably the next um, two to three weeks when we can actually um, dissect the data we get from our, our vendor. I think the bottom line, Ann, uh, for us, from what I've seen, it's not widespread at this point, uh, the ones that we have determined are fraudulent. It's not an astronomical number as compared to other states. So um, this may change, uh, but at this point in time, it's not uh, it's not enough um, again to be really concerned about. Uh, but we want to keep our eye on this. Okay. Yes, the governor is absolutely correct. Uh, it's not widespread, um, and the numbers are are relatively small when you compare them to other states that are reporting, you know, millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. We're not there. We're not anywhere close to that. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, it is 12.52, and we still have six callers in the queue. Steve, NEK TV. Can you hear me? I can. Uh, thank you. A uh, uh, quick one for the doctor and a uh, quick one for the governor, if I may. Um, uh, Dr. Levine, I had a question from a viewer uh, about uh, traditional flu. Uh, did, did we stop counting uh, traditional flu uh, the data in January or February? Um, it, it seems to have like dropped off the map. That's a great question for our epidemiologist. Um, but I can, I can tell you the short answer, but she may have a, a longer description for you. Thanks for the question. Um, one of our metrics that Commissioner Pichek presents every Friday is our COVID-like illness syndromic surveillance. We have a similar measure for influenza-like illness. 
we stopped reporting out on that in April, March or April um, because it was essentially zero. Um, you know, flu season is seasonal. Um, it typically goes away at some point in the spring and then picks back up in the fall. Um, so we will be reporting out the influenza-like illness measure in the next few months as we start to see flu activity again, uh, which is a reminder, everyone, get your flu shot when it's available. Um, we don't count in Vermont individual cases of flu, so we never report out on the number of cases of flu. We use the syndromic data, which you'll start seeing again soon. Okay, great. Um, uh, Governor, um, I had an old Yankee tell me one time that you shouldn't uh, hitch your horse to a wagon unless you knew it was in the wagon. Uh, I think it had something to do with prohibition. But going back to uh, Guy's question about Black Lives Matter, um, have you have you actually like read their their mission statement, um, uh, like their what they believe on their uh, on their website? And are you aware that uh, of their parent company, uh, which is a thousand current, and uh, and their vice chair uh, was a convicted terrorist uh, named Susan Rosenberg, who has quite a colorful history with bombings and stuff from the 70s? I, I can say with certainty, no. So you haven't read their their official website? I have not. What we believe? No. Huh. Well, uh, that answers that. Um, thank you all very much. Andrew, Gina. <laughs> Hello. Go ahead, Andrew. Hi. <laughs> I had a, several questions lined up about the situation in Manchester, uh, but uh, most of them have already been discussed. So I'd like to direct a question to Secretary of Education French, if I may. Um, He's felt pretty to left the, out here today, so he <laughs> loved to answer that question. I see him working on the sideline there. Um, I, I was just wondering about the original announcement that you uh, started the press conference with about the reopening schools. Uh, and whether or not the uh, teachers and the teachers' union uh, folks have been consulted about this, and to what extent uh, they're on board with the idea. There was some concern expressed earlier that I was aware of that uh, they were a little bit apprehensive about the idea of going back into the classroom in September, and I just wondered kind of where those discussions might have uh, landed. Yeah, hi, Andrew. It's good to hear from you. We're neighbors. Uh, <laughs> um, I appreciate the question. The, uh, just to reiterate, our guidance says it was developed, um, you know, and it's great to be on the stage um, with Dr. Rasco, um, you know, and our state epidemiologist, these folks uh, really, and their colleagues, uh, really, and it's just wonderful uh, to work in a state like Vermont where we can bring that expertise to bear and really uh, create, I think, some really excellent uh, quality product in terms of guidance. So the development of our health guidance to reopen schools was a very collaborative process, and uh, the, the Teachers Association of Vermont, NEA, uh, played a critical role in its development. Um, I think what you're referring to is the conversation that occurred after, because our guidance was developed, uh, I think, by the second week of June, uh, the conversation that occurred recently about uh, a question prompted by Vermont NEA, uh, should there be an additional state planning council? Um, and I, I did not believe it's appropriate. I still don't believe it's appropriate um, in particular. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we've, we've already had a very collaborative relationship uh, with Vermont NEA and a lot of stakeholders on developing the guidance, so I didn't see a, the need to have a second group uh, necessarily involved. But I think more importantly, what, what I'm observing now across the state uh, and including in your, your area, um, the work now is really about implementation. And uh, that work uh, isn't necessarily, in my view, organized well at the state level because there's so many variables that need to be taken into consideration based on the local school conditions and so forth and, and, and importantly the relations uh, between uh, the school district leaders and their employees and their teachers and so forth. So that work's happening now and that uh, was precisely my point why I was skeptical about uh, the ability of uh, us to, to handle those kinds of issues at the state level when really that hard work that's now unfolding at the local level is going to be critical to our success in reopening schools. Okay, thank you very much. Darren, Manchester Journal. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I wanted to confirm the numbers that I had heard uh, earlier. Total number of tests, was that 405? Yes. 
Yeah, 405. Okay, was that a combination of Londonderry and Manchester locations? Yes, I believe it was 286 in Londonderry and the remainder in Manchester. Okay, great. And, now, and, yeah, and you, uh, could add, you could add to that another half a dozen or so at uh, Grace Cottage Hospital. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Levine, the, the, the 405 tests completed in the last few days um, is an impressive number. Why is there such a struggle to get those 50, 59 antigen retests uh, completed? It sounds like perhaps they're not given, being given priority or maybe, maybe they haven't even been retested. Is that accurate? Yeah, I'm not sure it is a struggle. I won't know it's a struggle until I know what the final number is. Um, we're fully expecting to see more of their results in the ensuing days. Uh, if we don't, that will be disappointing. You're right. Uh, but I wouldn't call it a struggle at this point because we've been in contact with all but 11, and they've all been informed that their next step should be to get a confirmatory test. So I'm, I'm fully expecting okay, so I, at I, least all of those will have tests. And then uh, we're continuing to try to contact the 11 who we couldn't interview initially, um, and we'll continue to make efforts to work with them as well. Okay, I, I, I guess I was under, uh, under the misimpression that, um, that all 59 had been tested and that the results just were not coming in oh, no, no. more quickly than, than they are. No. Okay. Um, I, uh, on the antigen testing, um, you said it's not for, for non-symptomatic people. Uh, what, why is that? What, what is the, the, the science that, that, that makes it not work or, make, or produces these false positives? Sure. So in this case, um, I, would, I would focus more on the false negatives than on the false positives because it is a less sensitive test than the PCR. So there will be more cases of disease that it does not pick up uh, because of its lower sensitivity. And if you add to that having no symptoms, being in a low prevalence area, you further reduce the likelihood you will pick up uh, those cases. So you want to use a test that has less of a false negative rate in that setting. Okay, but, but you've got 15 people that tested positive with the antigen that have now been right. uh, that have now tested negative uh, with PCR, are those not considered false positives? Yeah. So no, you're right. So we can call those a false positive, uh, but the question will be, what is the reason for the false positive? Is it the fact that it was right. the wrong population being tested for that specific assay? Is it something systematic in the way the assay was done? Is it something to do with the timing of their PCR test, which we don't think so because we think they're very close in time to the antigen test. Um, so it shouldn't represent a resolved infection or anything of that sort. So those are all the, uh, the bits of detective work that we're doing uh, in, in tandem with trying to get these results reported on. Okay, so we're just we're eager for answers and you're just not there yet, is that? Correct. Exactly. It's, a, it's an ongoing investigation, like any of the outbreaks we've reported on to date. Um, it does take some time to get data, analyze data, reflect on the data, and provide an accurate um, assessment of what's going on. Okay. Um, you had mentioned earlier that the FDA is likely looking into um, the antigen testing and, and the results in this. So, uh, recently, the uh, Health and Human Services Agency announced that they're going to be putting this antigen test um, using the same testing device into nursing homes across the country. Um, it, it, what, what are your thoughts on that concerning the fact that a lot of these nursing homes hopefully are going to be asymptomatic people that they're going to be testing? Right. Actually, I, I referred to that uh, very a little bit tangentially earlier today. The fact is, um, we're probably not getting those devices here in Vermont, even though initially it was billed as these are going to nursing homes everywhere. I think they're being prioritized to the surge areas. So the reason probably being that those surge areas, because they're a surge area, have, have a higher prevalence of the virus already. They may, God forbid, but they may have nursing homes that have staff members or residents 
who uh, are becoming symptomatic. And for the purposes of protecting those who are not infected in those settings, they want to have a very rapid turnaround test so they can make very quick decisions from a public health and clinical point of view as to where a patient should be, in what room, what patients should be isolated from other patients, what floors should be isolated from other floors, etc. Because the last thing we want is to have uh, nursing homes that have a very rapid transmission of virus throughout the nursing home and uh, leave a lot of people very ill or, God forbid, dying. So I think that's their logic. Um, I do agree with your initial thinking, though, that the logic of putting those machines in a state that has low prevalence of virus and that they have uh, nursing homes where everyone is free of symptoms um, may not be the best use for them. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, one last question for, uh, for Governor Scott. Um, Governor, the London Dairy Select Board just very recently passed a, a mask, a required mask order, um, and the Select Board chair was quoted as saying, uh, we've been waiting for the governor to take the lead on this, and so, and, and he hasn't. Um, can I get your thoughts on that? Well, again, I, I answered this uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, I think we both have the same <clears throat> mission. Um, that we uh, we all uh, think that, uh, at least from my perspective, uh, believe that masks make a difference and uh, and they're advantageous uh, to to help uh, fight this virus. The question has always been, from my standpoint, is how do we get compliance? What's the best way to get compliance? I feel uh, education and guidance is the the right approach, uh, and we're doing that with our mask campaign as we speak, and that will be beneficial regardless of whether we make it mandatory or not. In the uh, early stages, I've given the flexibility to communities uh, to make their own decisions based on, on where they are and what they're seeing and what they're feeling. Um, I believe in local control, and many communities took, uh, took us up on that and, and uh, implemented that. Many communities across Vermont who don't have a high prevalence of, uh, of uh, COVID-19, for instance, in the Northeast Kingdom, uh, uh, may not want to go to a mandatory mask type of approach. Um, so it was just trying to be sensitive uh, to the needs of uh, the varying needs of, of those in, in Vermont uh, from a leadership pr perspective, giving them the flexibility to do so, I think uh, provides leadership. Um, having a mass campaign and providing guidance, standing up here uh, three times a week uh, in, in previous weeks and saying uh, that uh, masks make a difference and you should be wearing your mask, I think that provides leadership. Um, so. Again, I'm not taking it out of uh, the toolbox. If we see our numbers change right now, uh, we're doing really, really well in Vermont. Uh, something to be proud of. Uh, we have um, a high amount of compliance in a lot of areas. Uh, so uh, again, the question is, if we make a mandatory, uh, is it going to increase compliance? Okay, thank you. Avery, WCAX. Hi, my question is about the school hybrid online um, in-person reopening model. Um, so obviously there's going to be some internet connectivity hurdles to get over. So what is the state going to do to make sure students have access to broadband um, in the next six weeks when school starts back up? Yes, that's a, it's an important consideration. Um, we, just to back up a little bit on that, we published guidance on this concept of hybrid learning on Wednesday, I believe. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's going to be an important uh, tool for districts to have in their toolkit. Um, not sure yet uh, how districts will uh, employ that. We're seeing a lot of interesting creative uh, planning going on at the district level now. Um, but as, as we've mentioned previously today, I think the focus clearly needs to be on in-person learning because that's what's best for kids in a lot of ways. In particular, there, I think there should be a, a priority on uh, in-person instruction for the primary age uh, students. Um, but in terms of the connectivity, that's an important consideration. I think we have two, uh, two issues around deploying hybrid learning, remote learning. One is the connectivity and the other is to have the online tools to actually organize that. Uh, we were uh, able to get the legislature in partnership um, with the governor to uh, make an investment in our CRF funds, uh, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, to allocate some funds for a broadband. So 
uh, my expectation and, and hope would be that this summer we focus in on those critical areas, uh, sort of those critical last mile issues and make that initial investment. But I think clearly that's going to be a longer term investment that's needed. And um, I'm hopeful that uh, we've talking with our congressional delegation that there'll be future investments in this area. I think it affects education as well as telemedicine um, and broader, uh, broader systems uh, as we try to reach out and particularly some of our more remote areas. I think in terms of online tools, we've, we've made some progress in that regard since the spring. Um, at the state level, we've made investments in our expanding access to the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative, which will expand uh, basically for districts, provide them free access to a learning management system and a robust, robust set of tools uh, for professional development to help teachers learn how to teach online. Uh, we've also announced a partnership with Edmodo. Uh, to build out an ecosystem. So, um, you know, a lot of the ideas that Vermont teachers are creating now in, in districts are as they're trying to in, deploy our guidance, uh, we want to ensure that there's a way they can share the best ideas across the state. So that's that's essentially the function of Edmodo. So I think I think we've, we're on the right track to put those, address some of those issues, but it, I would agree it does, uh, you know, it's, it's a concern and there's going to be issues of equity. Um, I think that's precisely why we want to give districts the flexibility uh, to have the ability to deploy in-person instruction uh, as a priority, but also have the ability to fall back on uh, hybrid learning or even remote learning um, as the conditions of the virus change in our communities. And a quick follow-up. Um, what are the realistic expectations for students during this? I mean, a school day is typically eight, I mean, seven to, seven to eight hours. How are students going to get a full education? What are they going to be expected to be doing? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, it's it also for me as an educator, it points to, um, you know, when we start thinking about reopening, as the governor said, what does opening mean? I think as educators in particular, as we think about opening for the fall, um, our priority uh, needs to get, st get students back in the classroom and get them back together so we can begin to uh, assess uh, the impact of, of the virus and what has occurred in the spring in terms of remote learning. Um, you know, just the, the fact of opening school in itself is a significant intervention and uh, uh, important, so important to uh, students and also the, the vibrancy of their communities. So we need to we need to focus on that for very very strong, compelling educational reasons. Um, I think you know the larger issues of uh, you know the structure of the day and so forth. We we um, address some of that in our hybrid guidance, uh, hybrid learning guidance that we put out on Wednesday, um, which was essentially. Uh, some regulatory advice on how to navigate the attendance requirements and so forth. So I think there are ways to deploy uh, hybrid learning in particular uh, that can satisfy our attendance requirements. Uh, we're going to be interested in capturing data on that. Um, but there's going to be, I, I suspect, a conversation around asynchronous and synchronous learning, meaning to what extent is uh, particularly the remote or hybrid options synchronous with the uh, sort of in-person instruction. But all those, all those tools need to be out there for districts right now. Um, maximum flexibility, I think, is the word for them as they uh, seek to um, implement the guidance that we've created at the state level. Thank you. 83, w, or, sorry, Derek, seven days. Yeah, uh, two uh, hopefully quick questions for Dr. Levine. Uh, I'm curious why the uh, urgent care clinic in Manchester uh, didn't have the capacity to swab for these confirmatory PCR tests prior to this outbreak, quote unquote outbreak being discovered. Uh, the clinic told me that they had requested these test kits from the state repeatedly and hadn't been able to get them out. Right. And the second is uh, the second is that you mentioned there's one other site doing antigen tests. I'm just wondering where that site is. Sure. The answer to the first question is I'll have to look into it. Um, I'm not aware that there was a problem in getting them supplies, but obviously there was. It will be rectified. I know, I know that they have gotten some since. The second one, um, uh, there was a WCAX story last night and today. Um, that interviewed, uh, I'm not sure what his position was, a gentleman uh, associated with the spot on the Burlington waterfront who was uh, using the test. So that's the other site that I'm aware of. I was actually aware of it before uh, the news story, but uh, that's the one I'm aware of. So this is the only, this is the only doctor's office searching for clinic medical facility that's been using antigen tests in Vermont, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, yes. I don't know that that means there aren't others using it, and if they're testing negative, 
they'd have no reason to report a result to us. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Greg, the County Courier, it's 1.13, so please keep it brief. Yep, I, I certainly will. I uh, guess to keep the best for last here, Governor. Um, i got some questions about going back to school here. Um, I talked to a parent yesterday who, uh, in preparation for sending his son to Castleton, had been waiting to, to find out if there would be in-school or, or uh, online learning. Uh, and upon hearing that there would be in-person classes, uh, put down $1,800 for an apartment for first month's rent and uh, security deposit, whatever. Um, finds out yesterday that uh, the school's going completely online. Uh, so that money's you know, essentially wasted for that student and, and that student's family. Um, and, and at the same time, we're hearing that the state's making decisions to go uh, you know, to, to, to bring primary students back to school in the fall uh, and, and making that decision almost entirely based on Dr. Rouska's theories of spread among youngsters. Um, and it just seems like the, the state has some inconsistencies in the way we're responding to, to going back to school. You know, like we're like we're uh, making decisions from a two-headed dragon's point of view, or, or a seven-headed dragon's point of view. Um, what can you what can you say to you know making consistent policy? Well, thanks for your commentary. Um, in terms yeah. of uh, <laughs> Castleton uh, versus uh, K through 12, uh, two different uh, two different animals uh, from that perspective. Uh, that wasn't our decision uh, to not provide. Uh, um, in-person instruction at Castleton. I've spoken to a number of other colleges and universities uh, in Vermont uh, that are uh, planning uh, to have uh, at those in-person in instruction, hybrid type of uh, approach uh, with those uh, um, living on campus. Um, we, uh, I still believe um, that, uh, and this isn't just one expert, although uh, I believe that uh, Dr. Raska is uh, spot on and has done a lot of research on this. There are others uh, across the country who feel the same way. I mean, I think about the kids who get, who fall through the cracks because of, of not having that connection with their teachers, uh, with other, their peers, and uh, not getting the education that they so need and deserve. So um, we're, we're moving forward. I think this is the best approach. Um, I'll ask uh, Secretary French if he has anything to, else to offer, but um, we believe, as do many across the country, uh, that this is essential to our kids, and uh, if we can do it safely yeah, and, um, and find a path uh, towards doing that, I, I fail to see why we wouldn't. Yeah, I think you know, the governor's observation, they are two different animals. Um, we don't necessarily control the decision. I think uh, what I was going to use the opportunity uh, for your question is just to comment on uh, we will be coming out with guidance at the end of the month prior, uh, prior to the end of the month on uh, sports at the K-12 level, uh, which I think was part of the conversation, I think, also at the college level um, as they were making determinations. Uh, just to use as an example, where collegiate athletics or athletics are highly dependent on out-of-state travel and so forth, and that's not necessarily the case in K-12. So um, I think there's a lot of considerations that aren't necessarily applicable, but um, we've, we've tried to be very consistent, I think, in grounding our decisions uh, in K-12 on the science um, and uh, certainly having that be informed by practitioners. Uh, but I, I don't necessarily see them as being the same environments, and um, the students certainly are, are different in many ways in how they behave. So I, I know some parents have kind of looked at the situation and thought, well, you know, you have elementary high school students that are going to school, coming home, possibly spreading the virus to the home, maybe grandparents that are staying at home that are at higher risk. Uh, and you compare that to college students who are, you know, basically contained to a campus. Even if they do pick it up, they're, they're contained to a, a pretty small campus. Uh, you know, you're... I don't know, it just seems like a, a, a divide there. 
I'm going to have Dr. Levine weigh in on this as well. Now, I just wanted to re return to the college issue because we did have Rich Snyder here a week ago or so um, and extensively discussed uh, the reopening plans for colleges and universities in Vermont. And though Castleton uh, did come out with its decision and it is their purview to do that, there are abundant, and I will use the word abundant, other colleges and the University of Vermont within the state that have plans to reopen um, and have the same concerns you just voiced about you know, students on campus and what's going to happen, what might happen, but they are implementing all of the guidance appropriately and making sure that when students arrive, they have a, they have a substantial testing uh, commitment and a quarantine protocol so that they will try to keep their campuses as safe as possible from the beginning. Um, and then, of course, they've implemented tremendous other guidance uh, to utilize as the semester goes on. So uh, don't get misled into thinking that uh, the colleges are not reopening and they're an exception to what's happening in K through 12 education because uh, the majority of the colleges are actually looking forward to reopening and working very assiduously at making sure that this goes well and that they um, make it as safe an environment for everyone as possible. So just a quick follow up because I, I know Rebecca probably won't let me call in if I keep going. Um, there are some people that have taken this general topic and, and the idea that we're sending our kids back to school you know, based on Dr. Ratzka's advice that we're, we're essentially sending our kids in to be lab rats for the next year and, and see what happens. Uh, Governor, what's your assessment on that? I just fundamentally uh, disagree. Um, I believe that we are finding opportunities to uh, bring them back safely. Uh, we, uh, we enjoy here in Vermont a low positivity rate. Um, I believe we've gotten through a lot uh, over the last uh, four to five months. We've learned a lot. We can do things differently. And, um, and it's just so important uh, for them to have in-person instruction, uh, trying to bring them back. And if they can't have a hybrid approach, if we can't uh, do that, we have to come up with other ways. But the goal should be the same. What, what's the best, what's best for our kids? And if, uh, if parents don't feel comfortable with that, there'll be an opportunity uh, not to. Um, so uh, again, we're, um, we're just trying to do the best we can, uh, try and uh, pull in the same direction, get all the best ideas on the table, and uh, provide for the next generation and future generations today. Because what we do today uh, could have an effect on them for the rest of their lives. So what's best for them? Thank you, Governor. Okay. Is that it? Okay. Thank you very much for tuning in.